And today we have a great guest uh, from Microsoft, Aniket. He's going to talk about representation learning from clustering via building consensus. And he is, he is a, a diverse non-data science background. I may want to ask him that if he had done anything related to data science in his bachelor's and PhD, he got PhD from University of Michigan in electrical and computer engineering. And he has bachelor's degree in a great school in India, IIT. And uh, he has a variety of experience in data science and different topics, and especially He's a uh, good machine learning and reinforcement learning. And his current focus is on learning representation on text and image data from limited and partial feedback. And he has, he's working Microsoft ads and he's, he's utilizing reinforcement learning. And we, I'm excited to listen to him today. So Aniket, it's your time, turn now. Thank you Thanks, Murat. For, Thanks, Murat, yeah. for the nice introduction. Um, okay, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, you can see my screen, right? Yes, it's okay. perfect. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can go back and forth. Okay. Um, so hello, everyone. Good evening. For some of you, good morning. Uh, uh, I would like to thank Murat again for uh, giving me an opportunity to present here and for the nice introduction. Uh, as he said, I'm Aniket. I am working at Microsoft and the today's Presentation is a joint work with Jayant, Erin, and Urun. Um, so I'm not going to talk about anything related to the product. This is pure uh, machine learning algorithm. And the results here are purely on the public data sets. For more details, you can check the paper. Uh, let me see if you can get the laser pointer. OK. So for more details, you can check our detailed paper on this link. And also the code is available online to try out a few things. The, the title of the project is Representation Learning for Clustering by Building Consensus. And we are going to mainly focus on the clustering of images. So the representation learning and uh, the clustering, we want to do it for images. So, what is clustering? Given a set of data, we want to partition this data uh, into various clusters. But we don't have any underlying labels that are available for uh, learning this clustering or learning these partitions. So we want to cluster this without any supervision from outside. There are some popular algorithms like k-means, dbscan, spectral clustering, uh, which generates partitions given a data set. But these traditional algorithms, they uh, work on handcrafted features or already given features, uh, but they do not work or they do not learn the representations of these data samples. Now, the problem is we may not always have a good representation of a given data. For example, image or text, we need to, represent, we need to be able to represent this uh, various modalities into a representation that we can understand or representation that we can work with for some tasks like clustering. So these traditional alg algorithms do not work with or do not learn the representations. They work with the given representation, which may or may not be good for clustering. Okay, now what, what, can, what can you do? So, okay. The traditional algorithms don't work with the given representations, but can we learn these representations? Yes, there are some recent methods like instance discrimination, MOCO, SIMCLR, specifically for images, which can learn representation in an unsupervised way. For example, in this instance discrimination or using NCE, noise contrastive estimation loss, what they do is given an image, they get they have 
they transform that image to a different using some different data augmentations. And all these vari various augmentations should belong to the same cluster or all these examples should have the same representation. They use this constraint and uh, NCE loss to learn the representation. I'm not going to go into details we, of this. Uh, we can, if you have more questions on this, we can talk about it at the end of the presentation or maybe later offline. So there are ways to do the unsupervised representation learning. Now, the traditional algorithms don't do the representation learning, but there are ways to do uh, unsupervised representation learning. So one easy way is to just combine these two approaches, right? So you use this, you use this NCE to learn the representation in unsupervised way and use these features uh, and as an input to k-means, GMM, DB scan, spectral clustering, these out-of-the-box clustering algorithms to get the partitions or learn the clusterings. But this works, but these features may not be optimal for clustering. For example, the goal of this uh, unsupervised representation learning is very open-ended. So these features, these methods generally are um, evaluated for some different protocols, like linear evaluation protocol, what, where what they do is they use these features and then have one more layer and fine tune that layer for, let's say, supervised classification problem. So these features are not made for the clustering. They are general purpose features or general purpose representations. And we are going to see it later that these features are not optimal for clustering. There, there is a lot of room to improve these features for the clustering. So in this work, what we're going to do is we are going to do the clustering and representation learning in an end end to end way. Here, it's a two step process. We use some algorithm to extract the features and then some other algorithms to work on these features through the clustering. But there is, there is no connection between these two. Uh, it may not be optimal if you look at the, only look at the clustering metric. So our proposed method, um, to, to go into details of proposed method, we will divide this unsupervised presentation learning like NCE or the other methods, as I said, MOCO, SIMCLR into various categories based on the constraints that they use. Exemplar consistency, population consistency, and consensus consistency. I'll go into details of these three constraints now and then describe the proposed method. What is exemplar consistency? We want to learn a we want to learn closer representations for different augmentations of the same data point. For example, uh, you have some image of horse and you transform that image, maybe change its color, change the background, maybe zoom in, zoom out, rotate it. Um, the distance between the representations of all these data augmentations should be closer to zero. So that this representation should be very close to each other. The distance should be closer to zero. So the exemplar consistency is for the same example, the various augmentations should be closer to each other. Now, this is very popular in general purpose representation learning for like NC uses this, MOCO, SimCLR both use this. In population consistency, you want to learn representation such that two similar data points by some metric or any augmentation of the same data point should belong to the same cluster or they should be closer to each other. For example, uh, these images and their transformations and should belong to the same cluster or same population. So some existing methods like deep cluster and SWAV use this consistency constraint. Now, what does deep cluster do? This is one of the first algorithms which does clustering with representation learning in an end-to-end -end way. So what it does is using neural network, you get some features of the image and the augmented version of the uh, image. And when you get features of all the images, what you do is you run k-means on top of those features. And the, the k-means, the cluster assignments for k-means are used as the target label or used as a pop and used in a population constraint. 
if k-min says that these two representations should belong to the same cluster, it is used as uh, you can minimize the cross entropy loss just as a classification problem and update your neural network. You update the neural network and then again generate the k-means and update the neural network. So you have this uh, neural network updates and k-means work in tandem. So deep cluster was one of the first algorithms uh, which did this clustering with unsupervised representation learning in an end-to-end -end way. But uh, the recent methods beat this method very easily. Uh, we can do we can do more sophisticated than or uh, better than deep clustering. So we talked about exemplar consistency. We talked about population consistency. But now here, our proposed method depends on this consensus consistency, which is not being used in this representation learning frameworks before. So what it, what it says is, you want to learn representation that induce similar partitions for some variations in data representation space. For example, even if you use a subset of features, you should get the same clustering. Even if you apply random projection or randomly project these features into some different space, you should get the same clustering. Or if the whatever clustering algorithm you use, for example, k-means, gmm, any algorithm you use should give the same clustering. Or simple example would be k-means with different initializations. Even if you change the initialization, you should get the same clustering. So the consensus consistency is you should learn a representation that is induce the similar partitions, no matter if you change the data representation or change the clustering algorithms. So this is going to be a very powerful signal to improve the clustering algorithm. Now, there are th this problem. So this consensus consistency is uh, ill post, for example, you could have, you could, if all the examples, if one algorithm says that they belong to one cluster and other algorithms also say that they belong to one cluster, it may be wrong, but they agree with each other. So you could satisfy the consensus consistency, but not be right at the end. So the use of this exemplar population and consensus consistency together is what gives us better clustering algorithm at the end. So uh, I will go into more details of consensus consistency and uh, the algorithm that we propose. So as I said, for consensus consistency, you could change the data representation, maybe project this data you know, using random projection or use the subset of features, or you could have different clustering algorithms, or you could have different initializations of clustering algorithms. But in this paper, we focus on uh, the data representation, specifically random projection matrix. Now, let's say for these images, we get embedding X for each image, we get some embedding X. And what we do is we randomly sample a projection matrix A and transform this X to Y using this A. So this random projection matrix, we compute, let's say, M such random projection matrix, and we can transform this X to different M spaces, Y1, Y2, to YM. And we are going to use this randomly projected uh, embedding to do the, uh, to do the, uh, define the consensus loss. Okay, so let's see how we use this random projection matrix. Okay, so let me first define the soft clustering um, and what I mean by soft clustering loss here. So when we see k-means, k-means generally gives us hard clustering. So let's say we have n number of examples and I partition these n examples into k clusters. Now, we know that this particular example belongs to a cluster. So it is it belongs to that cluster with probability one. It does not belong to any other cluster. So with, with probability one, it does not belong to any other cluster. So this is called hard clustering. But here we work with soft clustering where one example could belong to one cluster with probability 0.7, other second cluster with probability 0.2, and third cluster with probability 0.1. So a soft clustering is just a, uh, here we define a cluster assignment probability, a probability belonging to a particular cluster. So here what we do is um, we given an image, we use F theta to learn the representation to get the representation. And we use one more neural network G 
to get the embedding Z. Okay, so one example, one image uh, gives us embedding Z. Now, we use the two augmentations of this image, view one and view two, to get embedding Z1 and Z2 using F theta and G. Now, this prototype C are basically cluster centroids or act, they act as a cluster centroids. They're not exactly cluster centroids, but you can think of them as a cluster centroid. And for now, you can assume that it, uh, we have good cluster centroids, but we are going to learn these cluster centroids uh, in an end-to-end -end way in the final neural network. But uh, for now, we can assume just to understand how the soft clustering works, uh, assume that these are uh, cluster centroids. Okay, so C are cluster centroids, Z1 and Z2 are my uh, image embeddings. Now, how do I compute the soft uh, clustering probabilities? So a dot product between Z1 and C, uh, so we have this K number of such clusters, so we have K prototypes. We calculate the dot product of Z1 with all these K prototypes. And when the, if the dot product is high, that means the probability of C1 belonging to that cluster is high because that C1 is closer to that centroid uh, because the dot product is high. So uh, to define precisely Pij1 for view one, uh, J is the cluster uh, cent or the, uh, J is the cluster number and I is the example, uh, see the example or the image I. We define the dot product between Z, I and C and we uh, do something like softmax to calculate the final probability. So more the dot product, higher is the probability that that example I belongs to cluster J. Okay, now P part is clear. So this is soft clustering, but if we want to learn this uh, representation uh, network, the theta and G, the embedding network G uh, in an end-to-end -end way. So we also need some target labels. So as I said, in the deep cluster, um, in the deep cluster, they used K-means to get the pseudo targets, right? In here, you could use K-means, but we use some algorithm called synchron knob algorithm, which was used in SWAV to get this to get these target labels. You might as well use the target labels from k-means or any target pseudo labels from uh, some other method. But in this case, we use synchron knob algorithm. So this is this Q accurate? No, these are pseudo labels. These are not the exact labels. So we are we are going to use the pseudo labels Q and minimize the cross entropy loss between Q and P. So this view one and view two should also, these both views should give us the same clustering at the end because they belong to the same image. So we use this fact and minimize the loss between Q1 and P2 and P1 and Q2. So in this case, we took care of exemplar consistency and population consistency, but we don't have consensus consistency. Yet. In this case, exemplar consistency was both this view one and view two should be closer to each other which is uh, defined by the fact that we are minimizing loss between Q1 and P2 and P1 and Q2. And the population consistency was through that we view this P1 and uh, P2 are basically calculated for, uh, we are calculated the cl cluster assignment probabilities of P1 and P2 using these centroids. So if two examples belong to the same cluster, they're um, their representation should be similar to each other and their cluster assignment probability should be similar to each other. So we captured both exemplar consistency and population consistency. But now how do you capture consensus consistency? So what we do is, so this part Z1, Z2 is what we saw in the soft clustering. Now in this case, what we do is we have additional consensus loss where what we do is each embedding Z1 and Z2 we transform it to a new space, C1 tilde, use, using a random projection matrix A1. And we have some M such matrices, M such random matrices, uh, and we have M such transformations, right? And we get cluster assignment probabilities using these random transformations. Now this P1, this cluster assignment probabilities should match to Q2. This P21 should match to Q1. So, no matter what transformations you do, finally, you should have 
same cluster assignment probabilities or cluster assignment probabilities that have agreement with each other. So in this way, we define a co consensus or we take care of the consensus consistency. So to define again more precisely, we have a cross entropy loss between Q2 and P1 delta, and we have M such P1s. And we also have uh, without loss of generality again for the Q1 and P2 delta. So this together, this LZ is basically a consensus loss. So LZ is our consensus loss, and LB uh, we take we take LB from uh, this NCE loss that we define. Now this again helps us take care of the exemplar consistency and also learn the representation. Just doing consensus consistency may not be enough, because as I said just doing consensus consistency, you may end up with a trivial solution. So you do need some uh, exemplar consistency loss to uh, <clears throat> avoid these trivial solutions. Okay, now why do these consensus objectives work? Like, can we understand more of what's happening inside? So here I'm showing you a picture of a synthetic data set. Two, it's a two dimensional data set and there are three clusters. Now, what I do is I randomly sample four examples from this entire data set. And what I do is, because we know the centroids here, I calculate the, uh, the P, the soft cluster assignment probabilities by calculating the dot product with the centroids. So for example, example one, belonging to the, the probability that it belongs to cluster one is 0.647, Cluster two is 0.259, and cluster three is 0 0.094. And there are, and all four such examples have these cluster assignment probabilities. Now, what I do next is I randomly uh, sample a random matrix and transform this Z or example Z to a new space Z tilde. And I also transform these centroids to a new space called C tilde. And I again calculate these cluster assignment probabilities. These cluster assignment properties are the very close to each other, but these are like noisy versions of the original cluster assignment properties. So if you're aware of the label smoothing uh, in supervised classification problems, we are doing something similar here. We are introducing noise in our labels or cluster assignment properties, which acts as a regularization for better learning. Now to understand more, this is a um, on STL10 real world data set, STL10 image data set. Here, what we are doing is for various embedding sizes Z, we are calculating normalized mutual information between the cluster assignment probabilities uh, for M such transformation. So M here is closer to 100 and here, what we are doing is calculating the normalized mutual information, which basically says if two cluster assignment probabilities are closer to each other, we have a high normalized mutual information. If, if they are not agreeing with each other, there is disagreement between those cluster assignment probabilities, we will have low uh, normalized mutual information. Now, what this tells is on X axis, we have number of epochs during training and Y axis, we have mean of normalized mutual information among these various transformations. So at the start of the training, we do not have any agreement between these various cluster assignment probabilities. But as training progresses, your agreement increases, which is what we want. We want to have at the end, all these noisy versions should agree with each other and should have consensus among them for the better learning. So. On this plot, in this plot, I, we show the uh, mean of normalized mutual information. And in this plot, we show the standard deviation. So as you see, standard deviation also goes to closer to zero. That means we are really confident about uh, this mean. So higher NMI, better agreement, and you get better and better agreement as the training progresses. Okay, I'm going to uh, discuss some results here. Um, so, Majority of the papers uh, in the image clustering domain, they show something called max performance. Or what it says is, um, what is the maximum clustering accuracy that you could get for any hyperparameter? So 
during hyperparameter tuning give me the maximum result so they are not talking about the mean or uh, average they are just talking about the max performance so generally this is a popular metric but this does not give a complete idea of how your method is performing so we here we are also going to show two more results how your algorithm responds to various hyperparameters of the algorithm and um, if the your model is trained on particular data set how does it perform on some other different data set okay so here is the max performance on the five popular image data sets um so some of these papers are cvpr 2019 uh, 2018 papers uh, bioil was out last year uh, this idft is the iclr 2021 paper and uh, this is our method so our method uh, the accuracy this is a clustering accuracy so for this max performance result we are to calculate the final performance we assume that we know the labels but during training we don't use labels this is just to show the final performance so accuracy normalized mutual information and this ari uh, all these three metric give some performance how how your uh, model is performing for the clustering and we show on image net 10 image net talks stl 10 cfr 10 and cfr 100 so on almost all data set we are beating the state of the art this consensus consistency is really helping uh, but only in one of the stl 10 data set uh, we are not beating the baseline but here we show that not only we have some intuition on why it could work but it works okay now let's see how does it work on uh, various hyperparameters so here we have pow pow is basically used in calculating the uh, soft so the cluster assignment probabilities uh, the learning rate the number of transformations the right now i said m we use the m number of transformation so we just so vary those transformation and this is just the log of the number of transformations uh, this is the dimension of projection space uh, user random matrix let's say a you are going to go from embedding z the dimension of embedding z to a other uh, dimension d that which is defined by the random matrix a and we vary that from 80 to 168 okay so here is the histogram of accuracy for various hyperparameters so we run for each data set we run closer to let's say 100 experiment um, on x axis we show the accuracy on y axis we are showing the histogram and the red dot here is how the baseline is performing now if your method is improving the proposed method if it is improving over the baseline if you see in terms of max performance we are better than one of the baselines right but if out of all the hyperparameters that we tried only only some of the hyperparameters were better than the baseline so now even the baseline they gave the max performance result so uh, their max was here but ideally what you want is a better method or robust method most of the hyperparameters uh, or many hyperparameters should lie on the right side of this baseline so in this case if you see on stl10 we are not uh, not all our hyperparameters are performing better than the baseline but the that's not the case with c400 in c400 our method is quite good where most of the hyperparameters that we tried uh, we improved on the baseline so that's the case i mean if you see here also in max performance in stl10 we are not performing as good as the best baseline but in all other methods we are performing uh, way better than the baseline so this also gives some indication that uh, if you plot for other imagenet and imagenet dogs we could see similar plot like this and this gives some indication that i mean max performance is enough but the distribution of accuracy for various hyperparameters gives a better picture okay now let's say you train model on one data set which has a different number of clusters than the data set that you want to evaluate your model on let's say you trained on imagenet which has 10 number of clusters versus imagenet talks which has it's a 50 number of clusters so how is your method going to perform now uh, this this column of the table we are we are showing what was the model trained on and this these columns are showing 
what was the more the method evaluated on so when you train on image net 10 and evaluate on image net 10 you get a very good accuracy 95.8 percent but when you train on image net 10 and evaluate on image net talks mm -hmm, your method does not perform as well similarly again with the docs uh, with image net talks evaluated on image net talks your method performs better than uh, the method that of uh, evaluated on image net 10. So what this tells is, uh, even though we are able to beat the baselines uh, in the max performance and our method is showing the uh, good improvements, there is still a lot more that we need to do to improve the current clustering methods. These methods do not perform or scale well when the, there are changes in the data set, when there are changes in the number of clusters, and you may need to retrain on the new data set. So ideally what you want is you want one method or one representation where uh, you are able to get the good clustering metric or good clusterings, uh, even for the data set that you haven't seen or you haven't trained on. Uh, you see the similar trend with CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100. Okay, okay. Uh, now in images, so as I said here, uh, if, you, if you remember, here we have these different views, right? We have for each image, we have view one and view two, and these views are nothing but different data augmentation. So uh, we try different data augmentations and we show which data augmentation is really important. So the all DA means we had all the data augmentation. Here, this is random horizontal flip. This is random grayscale, uh, random AB is random, uh, apply blur, uh, CJ is color jitter, and RRC is random resize crop. So these are different data augmentation. For example, random resize crop is you uh, take random part of the image, crop it, resize it. Color jitter is you add some colored color jitters to the image. Uh, RGS is you add some grayscale to the image. Horizontal flip is you just flip the image. So these are this is these are the ways to create different views of the image. Now which view is really important. If you use all the data augmentations, now here the plot is on x-axis, we are showing the training, uh, the number of epochs during the training. On y-axis is the clustering accuracy. If you use all the data augmentation, obviously your accuracy is good, but which of this data augmentation is really important? So if you see now this color, RRC, random resize crop, if you remove this augmentation, our accuracy drops drastically. That means the RRC is one of the most important data augmentations here. And we have seen similar trends for other methods too. Uh, the color jitter is the second most important because uh, the second biggest drop was for the color jitter. Uh, so this is this gives some idea of what data augmentations are important and what more data augmentations that we could use to improve the clustering. And we see the similar behavior even for C400. Um, so, I think in conclusion, uh, we define this new notion of consistency, uh, consensus consistency, which, uh, and we also have this abstracted version of exemplar population and consensus, which is the first abstraction that was uh, there in the unsupervised representation learning that we proposed. We improve on the state of the art methods, and we also have various evaluation criteria, which does not rely only on the max performance, but also on some other metric to show uh, the effectiveness of the method and some of the uh, downsides of the method. I think uh, that's it. I think I'll take uh, any questions. Thank you. Yes, here are some of the references. Okay, let me see if there are questions. Okay, I think the first question was, how do you figure out similar data points for knowing when to enforce population consistency? Yeah, so that's a good question. So, uh, okay. Yeah, so in the case of deep clustering, uh, one of the ways that they did is, <clears throat> they used k-means on top of the representations. Now, um, that they, they use CNNs as their neural network and CNNs are known to 
perform very well for the images so the learned the representations that are uh, coming out of the cnns are not very good but they are good enough that the k means or the clusterings that we do it makes sense so the k means they use it as a pseudo labels and as a population consistency constraint and you could use any algorithm like k means or the synchron hop algorithm to come up with this population consistency constraint so to uh, to go into more details i think you should check this deep clustering algorithm it's very simple to understand and works well but not uh, well enough what was your motivating application for image clustering where labels are not known so there are quite a few applications right for example um you have uh i mean one of the examples are from the medical imaging where you can have lot of medical imaging done on people but you do not know uh if particular medical imaging belongs to a for example let's say you're taking x-ray and you want to detect pneumonia you may not have enough labeled samples or you may have different types of pneumonia that you want to detect uh, I mean, i'm just taking, just saying one example i don't know if this example is going to be really useful in real life but in medical imaging wherever we need expert to get the labels is where the clustering is going to be very useful or image clustering is going to be useful so in the medical imaging case we need expert doctors which are and if you use doctors to label the images it is really expensive we don't uh, if you are using doctors time for this it is going to be really expensive so we want to minimize that cost now in in advertising this is again very useful where you get so many images from advertisers and uh, let's say uh you want to use these images for shopping and you are getting going to get so many images uh pool of images online and for a particular advertiser you want to choose uh, images for a particular category but we do not have labeled examples for such images now how do you choose these categories right how do you cluster these images and use a particular cluster uh for a particular category okay one question is why doesn't multiplying representation by a random matrix just produce random vector i think i already answered this but let me answer, let me remind again so note that we are so y has some information about x and a is a random matrix right um so let's go where okay one second where is the understanding consensus objective okay so it is clear from here right so we are not only transforming z uh, so x y is equal to ax so x is not just embedding but we are also transforming centroids and then we are using dot product of centroid the transformed centroid and transformed embedding into a new space and that dot product is used in the calculating cluster assignment probabilities so even though it's a random vector but we are doing calculating this dot product in a new space and we are transforming both uh, example and its centroid into a new space so that's why uh, we get this noisy versions of cluster assignment probability so we are not directly working on that vector but we are working on these uh, noisy versions of cluster assignment probabilities so going back to one slide so z1 is equal to a1 z1 but c delta c delta is also equal to a1 c so we are transforming both z1 and c to a new space and that's why it works uh why doesn't multiplying representation just okay yeah. okay why c500 accuracy for all is below random coin flip note that it is not a binary classification uh for c500 we have more than two number of clusters if it is just two cluster it would be random coin flip but we have in the cipar in the cipar hundred case we have 20 number of clusters so we are doing way much better than random random coin flip okay uh 
could you explain how you weight the three types of consistency the so the different losses so the question is could you explain again how you weight the three types of consistency so uh, here we have a loss uh, beta and alpha and we tune we treat this as a hyperparameter uh, what do classical eac algorithm do i'm not sure what does eac mean here uh, can you say what is eac here uh, okay i'll answer the next question is the k number of clusters known ahead of time okay this is a very good question uh, yes it is known and this is one of the again a big assumption that all these current methods assume and i think it is a strong assumption we need to get rid of this assumptions uh, in future work it is not trivial how to get rid of it but in future we need to there is one paper that was submission to last this last i mean iclr 2021 called meta k that paper was not accepted but uh, there are few works which does not assume the k uh, ahead of time but um, it does not perform as well as this method when k is known so that's a good question okay uh so i think one question is how does syncom nop algorithm work so again uh so to get into details of syncom nop i would recommend to read this paper called swav uh, which has these details of uh, syncom nop algorithm uh, basically what they are doing is uh, it's a form of optimal transport algorithm and they are solving a constraint optimization to get the final key uh, and the constraint being the um, your queue that you learn should belong to some transportation uh, holotope and uh, you solve that constraint optimization problem so i will not go into details of this uh, i mean i think just to present syncom knob would take uh, one hour so if you go into details of that but swav is a this is a good paper to understand the syncom nop algorithm okay let's see i think uh, was the ablation study what you used to determine the random resize crop uh, yes uh, yes so ablation study is what yes that's right we um, used it yeah it's to determine the random resize crop and color jitam are most important at least for clustering and this is also what we have seen in uh, some other papers for example uh, these idft paper iclr 2021 paper uh, it is called clustering clustering friendly uh, so let's say the eighth uh, clustering friendly representation learning via instance discrimination and feature decorrelation this icelr 2021 paper also had a similar conclusion that color jitter and uh, random resize crop were important okay so one question is uh, the evidence accumulation i think is talking about eac evidence accumulation clustering algorithm i am not sure what algorithm are you referring to or i am not aware of it there are some consensus clustering algorithm in the classical settings which we describe more in detail in our paper uh, but none of them it is not trivial or none of them uh, learn the representations they act on the uh, final clustering uh, final clusterings rather than the representations so i'm not sure what what algorithm you are referring to when you say saying evidence accumulation clustering but the classical clustering algorithm classical consensus clustering algorithm do not work well yeah the fredgen paper yes so uh, yes it does not it does not do the does not learn the representations yes all all our code was written in python that's right great there was a lot of good questions is it technical uh, technical meetup and we got a really good uh, engaging audience
Thank you, Aniket, for the presentation today. I appreciate your time and thanks everyone for the participation. You guys can connect uh, me or Aniket if you guys have any question, either technical or non-technical. Um, thank you for everyone. Appreciate your time, Aniket. Thank you.